Create Astronomy Cast, which is among the top rated and most popular podcasts in the natural sciences. Remember to subscribe to Event Horizon so you never miss an episode. Fraser Kane, welcome back to the program. Hey, good to be here. Fraser, now many things have happened this year from Artemis to James Webb, and now we have all these space topics to talk about, but what I really want to ask you about are Lagrange points. Sure. Yeah, I can't wait. Yeah, I bet you can't. Hit me with all your Lagrange point yes, questions. Yes, the, the, uh, the, many, the many questions. Now, Fraser, what we were just talking off air, this looks like what, this was a better year for NASA than, it, than it's had since the, the 60s and 70s. So, I mean, this was amazing. What was your reaction to the Artemis launch? Now, I was jumping up and down, but what was your reaction to the launch of the greatest rocket since Saturn V? It was, it was a clinch of the whole way, and, and I never, I could never get excited about it because I was so nervous about it, and there's no really clear cutoff point. Like, like when you think back to some of the, like, the moon landings, obviously when the people actually set foot on the moon and you hear that, that Neil Armstrong has taken one stall, small step for man, one giant leap for mankind, that is a moment that you can celebrate. But what is the moment that you celebrate the Artemis moon? Like, it, the rocket has ignited. Okay, good, good, everything's, it's cleared the tower. Okay, great, everything's looking good so far. Reach Max Q, it's detached solid rocket booster. Okay, great, nothing's exploded, and now it's in space. Hello. If you have a necromancer, and and this at no an point I think was I freaking out because I was so nervous about this thing taking off. And I still am. I think it's weird. It's this long, slow celebration for something that is still another week and a half in completion. But what we can say is that the launch system itself works. Oh yeah. And it we spectacular rocket. Actually it, it actually outdoes Saturn V like doesn't it? As far as raw power. Oh I don't I don't know if it outdoes Saturn V in this configuration. The this is the block 1A version. Well, the Block 1B version is going to be more powerful and will definitely be the most powerful rocket ever made. The, the funny thing is that actually the Space Shuttle was more powerful than this rocket is. But the Space Shuttle had to carry the orbiter in the space, and so it had to replace what would be propellant or cargo with a, you know, a, the Space Shuttle. And and so, in fact, this the, this rocket is is less powerful and yet capable of missions that the space shuttle could never do. That's something is that the shuttle was my launch system growing up. You know, it was like Saturn was done, and the shuttle was what we had. And as much as I love it, it was sort of a folly in a way because it just didn't. I mean, we're back in capsules now, and there's a reason. Yeah. If you go back and look through the history documents and see what the plan was for the space shuttle, it was going to be way cooler. What it originally was supposed to be is that the, what is the main fuel tank, you know, the big orange fuel tank, that was supposed to be an aircraft. And then you would put the orbiter on top of the main fuel tank and then it may or may not have those solid rocket boosters. And then the whole thing would take off vertically then the orbiter, the, the main fuel tank would carry it to essentially to orbital velocity, and then they would detach, and then the, the first stage would fly back and land like an airplane on a landing pad or on a runway, and then the orbiter would go to space, do its mission, and then it would also enter the atmosphere, and then it would land on the runway. And at some point, because of shifting requirements and challenges, they shifted away from that plan from a fully reusable two-stage rocket towards parts of it being used, but really a mostly disposed of space shuttle that we knew today. But I've been going on this rant that every cool idea in spaceflight is, is sitting in some technical document written in the 1960s by NASA. Everything you can imagine. You know, magnetic fields to surround spaceships, escape systems, flybys of Venus, missions to... It's all... They just didn't have the necessary technology to fight for it at all. There's a couple more recent ones I have to point out. Uh, uh, former chief scientist Jim Green, the program. 
has an idea for an artificial magnetosphere for Mars. Yeah. Now that's interesting. But, but you're right, most of those wild ideas really, really reaching out there. The practicality of things has prevented them from cost. But they do serve to show that some really amazing things we face if, if, we, if we have the funding and the ability to do so. Now, with Artemis, though, Oculus one question I have about this is, like, all right, we have a moon rocket, and ostensibly a Mars rocket, but what else can we do? I mean, can we launch a probe, direct probe to the outer solar system with this thing on a fast track? Or if we, if we see another neural moon, can we catch up to it with this monster rocket? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the Falcon Heavy is a really powerful rocket. But it doesn't, still doesn't hold a candle to what this baseball system is capable of, even in its current configuration, not to mention in that block one configuration that I mentioned. And when they were building it, they actually had a bunch of interesting applications that they might use it for. One, for example, was the Europa Clipper. They originally planned to launch the Europa Clipper on a, the uh, sentient has on an, an SLS 1B variant. With, with SLS, obviously, you can start building here in, in a good way and start preparing the to go to Mars. So it is a, it's a phenomenal large rocket. And as you said, this idea of Project Vera, where you, even today, you could chase down the Aurora and send a, a lander to, to go down and, and analyze this object today. You just need about a 30-year catch-up time for your rocket, but an SLS is perfect. Even a Falcon Heavy would, would do the trick. Neither of these are going to be in the near future. Starship that rocket comes online. Sometimes between now and the Sometimes between now and the universe, and then there's even further <laughs> the New Glenn, yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah. But I mean, New Glenn, I mean, New Glenn is, is chasing yesterday's ideas. I mean, it's going to have a fully reusable first stage, but it won't be a fully reusable rocket on the bottom of the stage. Nobody else is working on a fully reusable piece of rocket by space. Although that's actually a bunch of companies that are, that are working on their levels of reusability. That's going to be key, though, because it really does. I think that's the one thing that, that SpaceX has really demonstrated, is that reusability is... Oh, yeah. I mean, at this point, we're seeing these rockets land on the drone ships. So many of them have gone beyond 10 flights. Reusability, in the truest sense of the word, is now happening. And when you think about the Falcon Heavy, three of its stages are sparing the reusability of the upper stage. Pretty impressive. Yeah, and as, and as I recall, there were even some some murmurings about figuring out how to use other stages. Yeah, they could never figure it out, and that's why they actually shifted to the Starship concept. Them doing the map, trying to push the map to the point that it would work. And in the end, Starship was actually probably the minimum viable size for a fully reusable two-stage rocket. This the map works better the heavier these things get. And Elon Musk has said that in fact a one that is has an 18 meter thing would be even better than the one with a 9 meter thing. That's amazing. Do you think that that played into the decision why space had to go with stainless steel? Well, I mean, I mean the, that's a really interesting story because, like everybody, when you're thinking about food, fully reusable rockets, you go for lightweight material. And the obvious answer is really some kind of carbon fiber. And in fact, when NASA was exploring a single stage to orbit aircraft, there was the X-33, which is the penultimate venture star. And this was the rocket launching back in the 90s. And they were building this thing out of composite materials and, and they just couldn't get the weight and in the end they cancelled the project because they couldn't make a fuel tank that was light enough to carry the amount of fuel with the space in order. And in the end, SpaceX was going down the same pathway building this car fire vehicle and at some point somebody 
the mask said, what if you just need string out of steel? <laughs> which, which is crazy, but, but in fact, because steel is so durable, it requires less heat shielding. You can build it outside. It has more tolerances. We know how to work with this material quite well. And then you just have to make the spaceship bigger to compensate. And it's not a new idea. There have been stainless steel rockets in the past. So this is a right through. Even though it might look shiny in the space, it really is I feel like I have a bunch of old science fiction Yes, exactly. That exactly. Really, this idea was thought yeah. of. Well, I mean, if you look at 1950s science fiction in the pulp magazine, all of the rockets were famous for the shiny, beautiful, things. And what's interesting is that really was just like art of the really see the legacy of technologies that we need to Artemis. Yeah. Now, Artemis is also a cooperative effort. Oh, yeah. So it's called NASA, ESA, CSA. Exactly. What is Canada doing as far as... I know we did the Canada arm and all that sort of... What's, what's Canada doing with Artemis? I don't know. I know what East is doing. Well, great for you paid for it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm not actually sure what 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 the uh, what the contribution to the efforts are because I mean we're all going to go yeah. when we go to the moon. It's going to be international consortium, and it's interesting because if you look at the different space agencies, everybody does something slightly different. For example, the Japanese were really out there. They were visiting a comet. They, well, they were the first ones, as I recall. Mm -hmm. And there's just different interesting priorities. Whereas NASA, to me, seems to be somewhat conservative. I mean, after all, we've been to the moon and gone back. And maybe Mars, but it's sort of focused on the moon at the end. Whereas there's a lot of other places out there that we can see. So, do you agree? Do you think that. Totally. No, absolutely. Yes, we're more wrong. Really? Oh, no, I have. Oh, I. Oh, I have. <laughs> I've been more wrong. Well, maybe, 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 maybe. I, mean, I haven't, I haven't really delved into the catalog enough. But no, I, I think that the moon is the place. Like the moon makes obvious sense as the place to go, and it's not just setting boots on the ground, but actually going to space. It's, it's like the difference between people going and exploring Antarctica us having a base at the South Pole where various Sentient experiments scouts. are done in that you, unique will soon place. Attack. And everything that NASA is setting up for the Artemis missions this time around revolves around them going and actually setting up a long-term presence at the moon, which is the thing that should have been done in the first place. Although it was expensive, so it's understandable why they didn't do it. So I want to see a presence on the moon in the same way that we have a presence in the International Space Station, a presence in Antarctica. Eventually we'll have a presence on Mars, and maybe a presence on an asteroid somewhere nearby. So Look out for troopers. no, it, it makes absolute sense t to do this. And it's the same reason why the Chinese are, are taking this on as well. Even if NASA doesn't do it, you're going to see a permanently inhabited research station by the Chinese by the early 2030s. No question. No question. On the Chinese. They're, yeah. they're after it. And oh, yeah, totally. Personally, I think it's a good thing. Uh, absolutely, yeah. And, and not only not only just for the advancement of the human species, it also gives a political driver for NASA of its game and Congress to give them funding, more importantly, and get back into that, because that seems to be the only way we can really get things done proactively, very proactively. I mean, today. yeah, I mean, I think the thing is, that's really important to understand is that the moon is not a military, has no military value. And so it's not like putting satellites in the orbit of the planet. Look at this, we can drop a nuclear weapon down on your anything you want with 10 minutes notice. The moon is really far away. It's much easier to launch it. It is a demonstration of a nation's technological prowess to be able to do that. So it's, it's to go there, to go there and to live there and stay there and continue and expand and develop your technology. It is the result of a nation that is investing in science and And so I think that is the that's what that that's what China is trying to show. Hey, take it seriously. Oh I think that I think that was the advent of fast 
we're taking them very seriously. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they have the largest static radio telescope in the world. They also have the they're like the largest steerable radio telescopes in the world. They're like the big telescopes. A bunch of missions are building their own gravitational wave observatory. So there's a lot going on. For sure. Now, in regards to SpaceX, SpaceX. Now, this has been delayed, and delayed, which is to be expected. Never trust the human love timeline. Yeah. You know, always, always adds to the or more. But in this case, how far away do you think they are from the launch? Well, it's very hard to tell, obviously. And I think if you had followed Elon Musk's predictions, they would have done an orbital launch earlier this year, or even late last year. And but the, the list, the checklist of items, as we, you know, as we're recording this now in December, the official launch of the Musk and team is that the next test they're going to do is probably a 20 second test where they fully fill up its oxygen tanks, which is a dangerous step to take, and then run for throttle for about 20 seconds. And after that, they'll probably do another static test, and then the flight after that will be orbital. And so in the best possible timeline, they run that test next week, they run another test the week after that, and then they go orbital sometime in late December. That seems ambitious to me. I've been the saying March. I keep saying March. Uh, That's, I, I would concur just based on following it, but it's, it's probably going to slip. March is about that time. Yeah, yeah. You know, March for the lunch. And I, and I think that that there are, I mean, if it was me, like, I don't run a rocket company, so I don't know if they, they know what they're doing. And, but for me, the plan is to stack Starship on top of the Super Heavy and to launch the whole thing into orbit. And then the Super Heavy will return and land in the ocean, and then Starship will return and land in the ocean. And that, getting it back to land launch the silver. But like the Maxilla, which is the gadget that the staff has the the rockets and catch them. Because the rockets can't actually land in they only have landing legs. So, so lightweight. Instead as the land is captured by this giant crane. But that thing costs a lot of money. So if they have any accidents, that thing is gone. And it seems really surprising to me that they're not gonna be doing more Test. Like we saw a test of Starship it launched, belly flop, and then landed. Great. Why haven't they been testing this thing out day after day, week after week? And it's amazing. And they, and they were the first time that you see a heavy swim fly in the middle of the team. Why isn't this thing out there? And they're trying to prove that they can really nail the operation. So it, it seems really weird to me, but, but maybe that's just that's the step that they can test on a whole bunch of components also that they use, which never seems like they can really want to test the variable one of the time to Yeah, but it has to be said too, again, expense. Launching one of these, you might want to take the approach of trying to figure out whatever you possibly can on the ground before you and they're, they're very data space like rockets. The data collected from sensors and everything is you know, a lot more than normal because they want to try to figure it out on the ground. Plus, let's let's be honest, Twitter is expensive. So you can't. Right. Yeah, well, that's the thing. It's, busy. <laughs> it's amazing to me. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely think better things to do than, than try to moderate these conversations on Twitter. That just sounds like the worst job ever. Yeah, I wouldn't want that job at all. But then again, I mean, look at us with made our careers talking about stars. Yeah, I'm still entertained. Yeah. I am too. Oh, I've never lost interest. I uh, actually, I could actually say that it's increased. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, for a long time, you know, I was an amateur astronomer and we were directed to For a long time, I was I sort of not especially in winter and it was cold. So I've been doing that again lately. I've been dragging out the old Celestra and checking on Mars. I, it's funny, like I think, and I'm sure you get this too, but when people first show up on my channel, they come in with a head filled with science fiction Prepare ideas. They want to talk about wormholes and 
aliens and black holes. Yeah, this is very simple going to place. There's, there's various Death stars. Death stars, yeah, all these questions that come out. But after a while, they gain more knowledge, then the questions become a lot more nuanced. They're, they're interested in the updates to this mission, that mission, how this is all going to so that's going to be. What is this going to mean or that? Like, you can see this education that's going on, this maturing, as people are losing their childhood innocence, childhood innocence of science, science fiction concepts and shifting into the reality of the way space works and the way it's made. And I find it, I don't, it's kind of, I mean, I always use this sports analogy, but it's, but it's like, you know, for a person who really understands the game, the play, the drama, it's endlessly fascinating to talk about this game, that game, who won this, how, you know, how things happen over the course of the game, and the same thing goes on as people learn more and more about the, the actual nature of space exploration and astronomy, the more excited they become at the nuance, at the incremental things that happen in this, in this field, and they're less interested in you know, civilizations at the end of time. Well, I, I think a, I think a good example here would be all sky surveys. Yeah, there was a time when somebody first joins your channel, they're like, "Oh, well, well, sky survey." But when you find out what the LSS team here in the observatory is going to be able to do and how it's going to detect these interstellar objects like Muamua and outer hyperbolic objects and all these things that even more interesting to the Yeah, the example that came out fairly recently to me was there was this survey where astronomers have gone through everything that they can see that have been discovered. And since 1998, they took them all, they normalized all the data, double check all the observations, put it in scraping grid, and then they used this to make predictions about, or measurements of the universe at different ages, and they were able to confirm estimates of dark matter, with ever narrow air bars, etc. And it was excruciating work. Like the sum astronomical observations of all humanity over the last 30 years to build this list of. 1700 type 1a supernova your Rubin will do a million we'll find a million of these like it's bonkers yeah. how powerful this is. but and and the other one of course is guy like i just i just keep going back to the gaia well every time there's some new discovery it's often made with guy thanks to gaia the closest black hole ever seen the lightest neutron star brown dwarf orbiting another orbiting another star and so on it always comes back to Gaia they, they've, they've mapped out the shape of the Milky Way with precision it's amazing yeah I love surveys oh me too I, I'm, I'm very much uh, <laughs> and time surveys like Kepler um, you know and, and mm -hmm. with uh, I can't even remember the name of the mission now that we have that replaced Kepler um, totally slipping my mind like a plane like Tess you have to go like a planet hunter yeah it's Tess it's mm. another it's job Tess. well executed I just couldn't for some reason remember that that's 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 called turning 47 yeah oh, and, oh man so young <laughs> well not for long now fraser if you had to look back in the year in in review with dart james webb launch of artemis and all that what was the one that excited you the most what was the the development in space or or in in china what was the development in space that excited you the most well absolutely jwst i mean no question I mean, we talked about Artemis, and, I, and I'm, I'm excited about what the f future that Artemis holds. I mean, obviously, this first mission is uncrewed. Maybe the next one is going to have some people to recreate the Apollo 8 mission. It's going to be Artemis 3 when humans go and they get into a, a... They fly out to the moon and they get into a starship and they land on the surface of the moon and they get out. Like, that's going to be great. But no question this year, the most exciting story has been JWST with its picture perfect launch back at Christmas last year. I mean, we were almost a year since it launched. Almost a year. Yeah, but then the release of the the first science images back in July, and then there's just been this nonstop release of new papers and data and pictures. And I've been on it 
maybe more than most people have. And so a lot of people are like, I haven't heard much from JWST. And I'm like, I've been reporting two stories a week Please in my space in news blood. segment. It's Safe been itself. it's been amazing. And we're not even at the good stuff yet. The, the you know, the researchers, when they book time on JWST, they get a one year of of proprietary access to the data that they have requested until they have a year to write their paper. Just wait. And we've only seen a couple of papers. So the only paper that I know of specifically that came up from that JWST data, actually there's been a second one now that I've seen, but I'm sure there's been more, but one was the char characterization of the atmospheric data around the exoplanet and where they saw sulfur dioxide chemistry, water in the atmosphere, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, sodium potassium it was amazing clouds and there was one that just came out today where they mapped out uh the interstellar light the the light from the stars that aren't attached to galaxies intracluster light and they were able to make a map of dark matter using these this light but but they're they just keep coming and so the pictures are amazing. The the snippets that we get, 